when you guys can actually start seeing me. I need to make sure I'm not like doing anything weird. This is our wisdom candle that we're gonna light for tonight. <gasps> I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I almost forgot the freaking song of the day. Johnny Cash. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. Denise, get in here. <laughs> because you're mine. Thoughts on the Talk To A podcast? Well, you know. Sometimes hey, you just gotta let people have their 15 seconds of fame. Somebody asked what our thoughts were, and, and I think this is pretty crucial, on the Talk To A podcast. The what? The, the, the Hawk To A girl. She has a podcast. Okay. And so I said, well, sometimes you just got to let people have their 15 seconds and see what they do with it. <laughs> you know, I was curious because when I first showed up, you weren't singing, and I was a little disappointed I, just yeah. telling you. I was like, oh, man, no music for me? I was trying to light the candle of wisdom. Oh, I love that. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes we do the friendship candle, and that one's pink. Okay. Yeah, so tonight we're on wisdom. Good. Well, you guys, we have no guest tonight. We have a debriefing. We are going to be just decompressing a little bit from the weekends that we had, and I'm sure we both, I know I did, did saw and observed some things and learned some things and have some key takeaways. I can't so what did you do? Wait to hear about, I want to hear about your weekend because I experienced oh. mine so I already know about it. So oh, what, well. tell me about your, your weekend because I don't know what you did. Valid. Um, I was in Kansas. This is the most exciting part is that I can't, I mean, there are obviously other states that the prairie exists in, but Kansas is a quintessential part of that. And generally living and being in Kansas is not exciting. You know, the storm. Really? The but, no, I mean, but, but what when the tornado comes and, tor and Toto gets pulled? Mm -hmm. That's no, pretty no, we just We just stand on the front porch and watch. Yeah. I had, a, I had a reel one time where there was a tornado literally going right in. I mean, my camera was right there and there it is going by in the background. And then I pan down to Enzo and he's playing with a volleyball. Wow. And that's Kansas. Like, you know, it's just, it's almost like to me, hurricanes seem absolutely terrifying. Yeah. You know, um, relative, right? Yeah. But, but I'm not used to it. I don't, you know, I don't live in, in places where that happens. So yeah, it's all relative, but this weekend it was great because, um, you know, for upland gun dog hunting, you, this is the place to be, or, or in the South, a lot of people do it in the South. It's very popular, but, um, so I went just hunting in general, which is nice. That's on foot. And there's three dogs. So there's a drawhar, which is a, a wire hair German pointer, pointer for those that don't know, an English setter and an English pointer. And the first thing that I would like to say is that all of those dogs are intact. Mm -hmm. And there's two males and one female. Mm -hmm. I think that would blow a lot of people's <laughs> minds. What was that? I, I, I was petting his little ear. <laughs> and you know, little man? Are you okay? I, I thought that that sound something. came out of Zen. No, 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 no. I was like, why would he ever make that sound? I just... Brito, I know why you would make that sound. <laughs> Something wrong. So I think in the working dog world, intact is normal mm -hmm. and typical, and they don't give it a lot of thought. Yeah. Um, it's the same in the horse world, too. It's just normal to have a stallion, and, you know, you got to keep them in line. Yeah, and they're kind of big, so I hope you get it right, because that's, like, way, to me, way scarier than a dog. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know, like some of the best horsemen and i'll say men to be specific because i'm thinking of men that i know i've been on their stallions in a sea of 
other horses and it is high octane lots of and it's you know there's a lot of energy in the air and it's cold and you're at a really high elevation um and there it, it was one of the best horses that i've ever been on so oh, cool. it really is like but you know the person that owns that horse is a true cowboy he he's he runs a ranch he does it all day long every day and he rodeos on top of that and competes in all of this stuff you know so you can see how that has so much more to do with you know why that horse is so phenomenal than just the fact that you know he's intact and he keeps him in line you know it's a, he has a real job and a real life you know so it's cool to see somewhere to go with that energy yeah side tangent so um i went to the pointer trials the english pointer derby trials and Basically, so I asked a lot of questions. I didn't tell anyone I was a dog trainer unless they asked me, and then I said I was a pet dog trainer, and I have no idea what you guys are doing out here. And I played the dumbest dumb that has ever been dumb. And let me tell you how refreshing that was. Relaxing. It was relaxing. It was, I was like, oh, oh, well, I didn't know that. You know, yes. now there was yes. one point and I'll get to this, I'll get to this because I, it's a highlight that I want to talk about with you and um, because it's something that happens to everybody. But what I noticed was the camaraderie for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I noticed the all ages. Mm -hmm. There was a, a gentleman that was probably 18 or 19. Um, there were people that were my age. There were people that were 80. There were people, and everybody's up on a horse. Everybody's doing the deal. There were women. There were men. Um, everybody was pretty country, because that's how we are out here. But it was just, um, it wasn't really about anything else than getting together and showing off my dog that I, I love so much and seeing how he or she does um, representing your kennel. So you're there as a, like, hey, I breed these dogs, and I also take this very seriously. You know, we train, we trial, we do all these things. I felt that spirit there. But everyone was just so excited to have someone new there that was yeah. interested in the sport cool. and that rode horses. And, and, you know, and then they found out I was a dog trainer. But, it, but I let that become like a natural part of the conversation when people were curious. I didn't lead with that or anything. I don't know what they thought I did. I think maybe they thought I worked with horses or something, um, but I didn't I didn't say any of that. I, I rode a horse that I typically do not ride, which was a whole new experience for me. I don't ride gated horses. We ride, um, I have a paint. My daughter has a thoroughbred. Like think quarter horses, Mustangs, those kinds of horses that are not gated. So they don't have this specific like walk that they do. Um, and in this sport, they ride Tennessee walkers, which are gated. Um, and it's very different. You don't, you don't lope, you know, you trot or you walk really fast, right. which is basically like my horse's fast trot, you know, but they're not, not going to break into a run. So like Layla and I loved to race. We loved to run around in fields and be crazy, and, and you wouldn't do that on one of those horses. But if you want to get on a horse and go around for five hours, you know, trialing or hunting or doing whatever, I could see why they would choose that. And I could see how you can continue doing that sport well into being an actual senior citizen and still have something to look forward to and a community to be involved with and dogs to run. And, you know, it just was like probably the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. The, the single most exciting thing, I, I can't remember ever being that happy in my entire life. Wow. I mean, maybe outside the birth of my children, but that's, you know, those are obvious. Obvious, yeah. That's, I was, that's I was truly like, what did you, I just looked at my boyfriend and was like, when I came back, I, I just had this look on my face and he was like, what did you think? Oh, and I just wanted to oh. burst into tears. I was like, what was that? So now I'm in love with pointers, which is so exciting to me because that's the dogs that my grandfather ran. And he also hunted on horseback as well as on foot and also had 
Um, well, I th think he had fox trotters, but it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is, I felt like I was like falling out of an airplane, like skydiving with no parachute, like just free fall falling the whole time. And then I plopped and landed on the horse just perfectly, much like Dorothy probably would have in The Wizard of Oz. I think so. <laughs> so. And of course. Of course, this is the Diana Ross Dorothy, not the Judy Garland Dorothy. And plopped down on my horse and was like, and then the Disney song came on and all of my ancestors were like, she made it. We thought she was gonna die. We thought she was gonna do a different job. We thought she, we, there were times where we were like, she's not the one, she's not the one. And then there I was. And it all was like this in that one moment, it was wonderful. That's so cool. Tell me about the logistics. Was this an event, like a trial, a competition, or was this uh, like people going out as a group? What, what's that? It's both. It's okay. both. So they have what's called the, I know. I was like, oh, we can all go. It's so um, you're on, everybody's on horseback that's out there. There are two judges and they're both on horseback and they stay behind the handler and their dog. Then there is the gallery and the gallery is just, everyone that's there. We just all go out together. You do everything together. And if you just have to stay behind the judges, if you're in the gallery, and then the handlers are working their dogs in the front, two handlers at a time, each on horseback, and each handler must have a scout. So you have to have, have somebody help you because in trials, you can't use GPS. <laughs> you know, when we're walking out on the prairie, you just look down and you can see the dots and know that they're 200 yards this way, 400 yards this wow. way. Wow. Right. So in in the trials, they don't, you cannot go out to the actual prairie and do them because this is complicated because those lands are owned. So the government leases land so that hunters can hunt, but it's only walk-in access. And there's a map that tells you what the public lands are. It's, you know, hunters know all about this, but you can't walk horses in there for lots of different reasons. You're introducing that big ass animal into, you know, it's just, you can't do it. So when they trial, they use also private land, but it's owned generally by somebody in that kennel club. So they all will put, basically put up portions of their land and they're always tree lined. So you use like large, like acres and acres that are mushed together of farmland, but it has to be tree lined and that's just your perimeter. And your scout helps you keep an eye on your dog, you know, cause they're like 200 yards away from you, 300 yards away from you. You can't that's always amazing. see. Yeah, it's incredible. And then everybody has a whistle and the whistle blows mean different things. Like three whistles calls your scout back. So if you've sent your scout out to go find a dog and then you blow, 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 that means that they need to come back because you've got the dog. You've got eyes on. They don't need to keep wandering around. Um, the most interesting thing though is like when you hunt with dogs on foot, it's just quiet. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess unless you're chit chatting with each other, it's not <laughs> like, it's not like deer hunting. Blake. <laughs> my son's friend <laughs> he grew right. up here so i talked to him like he's my son um so when you're out, out there like okay so let me go back to where i was when when you when you call your scout back your scout is essentially just there to keep eyes on but the way that you have to deal with your dog is that you you have to always be in contact with your dog and that's different than when you're hunting when you're hunting, you let the dog hunt and you look at your GPS and you're like, they're not moving. They're still not moving. Okay. They're on point. And then wow. you go to where that is. And the dog sure enough has been holding that point for the five minutes that it took wow. for you to walk there. Wow. And you're That's walking amazing. like this. Yeah. Your, your feet are like you're walking through a cotton field, you know, because you got to pick up your, and so, and you're up these huge, big inclines that are these beautiful hills. Well, in the trial, that's, you have to be in contact all the time with them. And the way they do it is they sing a song to their dog. 
So when your dog's doing what you want it to do, you go, oh, like these long, long calls. Enzo, open the door, come inside, open the door, come inside, open the door, come inside, You're being annoying, come inside, go downstairs. I tell you what, boys, Cletus, Leland, Leland Jr. Sorry, it's hard. Both of those boys screw up here. And then when your dog's not doing what you want, you go, and so all you can hear is like these songs and they're different. Like a man, one man's doing it, a woman's doing it. And the judges are just watching and what they're watching for is just the potential of the dog. So is the dog running around doing nothingness? You know, you and I have talked about this before privately, the dogs that are so high arousal and so whacked out that they can't even do their job. Um, they're looking for that. They're looking for um, what's called tagging. So when a dog is, really not hunting and using their nose, they're following the other dog. So they're looking for that. They're looking for the length that they can hold their point. Um, you know, just different little, I asked all the questions, different, yeah, good. Little, different little factors. Um, but you can start- What are they hunting? Doing, what's that? What are they hunting? So they could be, they could be pointing anything. Like right now it's prairie chicken season, but you're not gonna find prairie chickens where in the middle of a, like a kind of more agricultural area you the prairie chickens are shy um so they're not gonna be out there but but there there certainly could be like cubbies of quail out there um you know and quail or <laughs> um so i showed a video of little sue who's only 10 months old so she's just phenomenal pointing a covey of quail and how excited she got and the little yips that, she, that they do when they find birds. It's the most precious. Uh, it's just, it, that's the best word. I, it's precious. She was so happy. And, and to hear, you know, a really masculine man that's really stoic say, good job, little girl. You know, and it's nothing that he taught her. He's encouraging her natural instinct. You know, it's not like something you can take credit for. It's something you can like, behold you can't you know so it's it interesting but he said i said well that was awfully nice of those quail i mean we just got out of the truck we just went under the fence and he's like oh that's why they're called gentlemen bobs the bob whites and i was like what do you mean and he said because they'll just let you sneak up on them like that so we call them gentlemen bobs i was like is that a joke wow. you, jo no that's true that's why they call them that there's all these little like tidbits that you get it's a culture. It's yeah, a whole it's culture. culture. Yeah, and you get these little like tidbits, and you know, hunters love to talk about birds. They want to talk about birds. They want to talk about the fucking birds. I said a cuss word. They want to talk about the birds. <laughs> and so, if you let them, you find out all these really fascinating things about the bird that, if you're a dog trainer, tells you about the dog. You know, like where prairie chickens will roost and that they leave these little poops and and that's what the dog is looking for and smelling and then you learn about air washing and how when prairie chickens fly up the wind washes their feathers and takes some of the scent away so the more time they stay on the ground the better the dogs can smell them you know it's just it was just quiet it was quiet and it was just like having master class after master class in actual dogs like not whatever it is that I do, which is wonderful and I love it, but it's not what they're doing. So I kind of divide up the things we do with dogs, right? We've got pet dogs, mm -hmm. companions, mm -hmm. that's important. We have performance dogs. So performance dogs is like agility, uh, obedience in the ring. It's things any breed of dog can do that you can, tr if you can train the skills, you can do it, right? And then there's working dogs. So the working dogs are the pointers, the Belgians that are doing protection work, the border collies that are doing sheep. And I have great admiration for all of those for different reasons. Like what I tell people in the working sports, I am like you, just fascinated. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a retriever, a pointer, a border collie, it doesn't matter. Watching a dog do something that is so genetically wired in, it's like the go is there. Your training is really about the stop. So you can't put the go in the dog. It's very hard to put the go in. 
the go is in there. Now you're going to add some rules and create a stop. Whereas performance is really interesting to me because if there's no go at all, why would the dog care? There's a teeter totter. They don't just pop it. <laughs> so like your job is to put, you know, the go into the dog. And all of these things bring out different challenges. So I really enjoy the process of getting a dog to try to motivate a dog for minutes to do something that they're not wired to do. And I also really enjoy watching a dog do something that you just suggest it. I swear to God that, that it's so in there. They, they're just the very first time they see the bird, they see the sheep. I think that is so cool. And that is why I really, I admire anybody who trains any dog for any event, but personally, if I am doing a working sport, I want a dog that's bred for it. I don't, and I've done it the other way. I've taken a dog who wasn't bred for it, the right breed, but not the right bloodlines. Mm. And I got a high level uh, protection title on him. But after I did it, I said to myself, I'm never gonna work that hard again. Because I had to, he had some go, but not a lot of go. So it was a lot of work. And now I work with dogs that have so much go. And watching that is a huge high for me to mm -hmm. see them just do just do the thing, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, I have sheep and I have a sheep problem. If you have sheep and you don't have a sheep dog, you have a sheep problem. And so I'm gonna solve my sheep problem by getting a sheep dog. And people <laughs> are like, oh, well you can use a border collie for that. I mean, you can use a Belgian shepherd. Yeah, you can. That seems and you're gonna have to work intense. hard. I mean, you, can, <laughs> you, get, you get dogs that have a little more of a herding perspective, but oh, okay. I don't want to train up a Tervuren for herding. It's not because you can't do it. It's because I want a dog that when it's 12 weeks old, I put it on the ground. I want to look around and say, those are sheep. I bet you want them in the barn. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, it's like, yeah. it's like an eight-week-old pointer. You put it on the ground and it looks at a bird and it freezes for five minutes, right? A lot of that, it's not that you can't teach dogs to do those things. It's just, I want to be on the other side, which is, okay, let me tell you the rules around it. Because sometimes I don't want them in the barn. Sometimes I want you to take them out of the barn and put them in the field, which is the opposite of the genetic code, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want you to bring them to me. I want you to push them away. And I'm so excited about that because I love all working dog sports. I don't, doesn't matter what it is. If it's a dog doing what that genetics tells it to do, I see so much beautiful happiness in yeah. those dogs. And I'm so drawn. So then, you know, when people are like, oh, dog sports are terrible and all, they can be. Anything can be terrible. Anything. You know, the wrong people training it and they do mean things. Yeah. But done well, it's so beautiful. It's so much a part of what these dogs are. And mm -hmm. I think that's super. Mm -hmm. What a great weekend. I mean, I would have loved your weekend. Except for and the part you would have really horse. loved it. You, you I, really would have. I would have. So but I can't I got... sit on a horse because my, my butt hurts too much. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because of the what? The horses would make your butt hurt or from your weekend? No, because the butt might because I have enough I don't have enough fat in the right places on my butt anymore. To I don't either. Oh, how do you small, deal with I'm that? I'm a small butt gal. Well, and you would think What do you do about that? You would think it would matter, but the horseback riding actually helps. Well, if you're just gonna sit on a Tennessee walker, I don't think it's gonna help. But if you, you know, have a different type of horse and you're posting a lot and using your I yeah. think that that's why they all have great legs and you know, the back the back side of their leg. So let, let, I want to talk about something else from this weekend. It's controversial. Oh, Ever. wow. All right, go. Do we have to talk about this first? Like, do we have to mute the entire world while you tell me what your idea is? No. Or can we just run with this one? No, we can just go with it. All right, we let's can do go it. With it. So what, what do you think about... What, I'm going to have to edit the heck out of this before I put it on YouTube because there's so much dead time and interruptions um what do you okay so uh, obviously these dogs have e-collars on that are working yeah. you know it, it's um for a couple of different reasons when they first have them they put them on a really low setting and they put a collar on their, their belly like a regular collar and that's how they first teach the dog to whoa mm -hmm. whoa because you can't all you have is whoa leave it come here you know they're the dogs are so far away from you yeah. and if a dog is pointing and another dog comes running in they're gonna ruin it you have to, whoa you know just like you the sound that you make with a horse 
So they do that at first. And then sometimes they put the collar on their belly after the regular collar so that when they start working further away, they still feel that pull from the whoa and they pair the feeling of pulling slightly on the belly, like on the belly collar with that whoa. Then they, then they phase in the e-collar and then they take it off completely and it's just voice, that's it. And the e-collar goes here and it's for aversion. It's for, oh my God, you are chasing a bobcat and you're 300 yards away from me, you know, or whatever, 100 yards, 50 yards is still too far, mm -hmm. you know, or you have decided on this day among all other days that you never do this, that you're going to go underneath that fence near that bull who you're, you're not going to probably do anything to it because you're trying to point him, you know, idiot, <laughs> but that bull could kill you. Yeah. I mean, I saw one of the biggest bulls I've ever seen in my life one of the biggest bulls I've ever seen in my life this weekend. And I was just like, oh my God, he could just crush a dog like that. Yeah. You know, things like that. So they have him on there as that, but I really didn't see maybe once that I've the entire, all these times I've been with him, I've only seen him use it one time on one of the dogs. And it's because she, he was chasing a cat into a Milo field. Like, a domestic cat someone's clearly at you know a farm out of from a farm or something and he was afraid he would kill it and so he used it and he came out of the field and came right back and was fine you know but do you think that the average person who wants to ban e-callers in totality do you think that they want to ban them all or just from pet from pet owners is there well, a spectrum of this can we take yeah. them out of stores yeah but make them still available to hunters people that are using it what how is that ever going to be they're ever going to be compromised or how is that going to be mitigated i really think there's a huge range i know balanced trainers who really don't think they should be sold in stores uh, i don't think they should be sold in stores no I mean, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people kind of even who use them who believe that because of the potential for abuse and because those collars run up absurdly high. I mean, they're just, yeah. I know I've touched an e-collar on the highest setting and that's not a joke. It's, it's a thing. Like mm -hmm. it's a thing. Oh, so, it just made me like, <laughs> I can yeah. Well, it. when, when people are talking about like low level use, if that's true, then they shouldn't be going up that high. They shouldn't be going so high that I'm like, holy shit. Like, you know what I mean? It, Cattle prod high. It's ex yeah, exactly. And then, you know, you've got, so if, if we're going to have tools out there that are that severe, I think a lot of people do agree that we need regulation. But what I'm seeing is people who use the collars are afraid to even have this conversation because they feel like they're giving away the store, right? So it's like, right. if I even say that, yes, sometimes they're used in ways that's unkind or abusive or whatever, then I'm giving up my position. And that is because of the almost, because both sides are so poorly educated about the other side that they feel like they have to do that. Like they can't admit that there's issues because it'll be used against them. But if you just talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, I think there are a lot of balanced trainers who believe that, you know, just being able to go over to Amazon, a 13 year old can buy it off Amazon, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And do, and they do. And so you got everything from people who want low level regulate. And then there's the, you know, well, the government gets involved and everything goes to hell. Mm -hmm. And there is some truth to that because who's going to direct the direction of it. Right. So you got everything from, I'd like some regulation all the way to, um, no e-collar in any circumstances. If the dog is going to chase the cat, you know, you can do these other, there are other ways you can train it. It's hard. The other ways are hard, especially when mm -hmm. you have a dog at 200 yards, that job is to go out there and find yeah. birds and do these things. It's not like <laughs> you can't really do that on leash. Does that mean it's impossible to do it without an e-collar? Well, realistically, there was hunting before e-collars. So of right. course it's possible. Right. And that actually does bring up another issue. I actually have concerns that because e-collars are so widely used that it actually influences our breeding practices. Mm. So rather than breeding for dogs that have high will to please, and that are more responsive, we breed for harder dogs that work well away from the collar, 
rather than softer dogs that work well to please the handler, you know? Yeah. And these things are related. Like you can't separate out breeding decisions from training decisions. You can't. Well, on that point, um, I was told this weekend, my boyfriend said, I will never own another German dog again. I will never, ever, ever own another German hunting dog again because they're bred way, it's too much. It's yeah. too much. He thinks that, I mean, he used the word aggressive. He yeah. used the word aggression. So I'll just say what he said, but he's like, I just, it's too hard for what I'm doing and what I'm in it. I think what he was trying to say was that it's a lot for him to manage. You know, he's like, maybe if it was just me and him, okay, fine, but I really like to have these other dogs for these other purposes. And his one of his best friends has the litter mate and on site, those dogs will try to kill each other on site. So that's stressful because, mm -hmm. you know, they got the dogs to enjoy hunting mm -hmm. all of these places in America together and they can't hunt them at the same time. They have to swap them out. And, you know, so I think that, that, that to your point, we are definitely not, <laughs> and I can't speak to, I can't speak to working dogs because I'm not, I'm just getting into that world, but we're definitely looking at very different dogs than we have in the past. Yes. And some one of my takeaways from the weekend was, you know, there's so many things that I want to do that are just not, not safe and practical for me to do with an American bully. And I know plenty of people that have bullies that have horses. So I don't want to like make it seem like that. But I just, I don't know that I'll have, have any more after this. I've been doing it for, you know, 20 years now I've had this breed. Um, pits, bullies. One of my dogs was um, Pitt and Rottweiler, who was massive. He was a fantastic dog. But I'm just kind of, I don't know that I, I want to perpetuate that we should be having these dogs as pets. And I know that's probably really hard for people to hear me say that because I, I do champion the breed and I do love them. I, I, can't, I mean, I've had so many wonderful memories with all of my bully breeds over the years, but I was a very different person then. Mm -hmm. I was much more aggressive. I felt like I had to prove something all of the time. I felt like I needed everybody to know all about me by looking at me. That's where the tattoos came from. Some people get tattoos to keep people away. I just wanted people to know how cool I was. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. You know, it's all, it's, it's always been about image for me in some way, because I was so desperately trying to be seen and it, like for who I actually was, but I did all this other stuff and I got to tell you, I've met some other people that are my clients that have dogs like I do that did the same kind of thing. Why do you have that dog? Have you ever investigated? What is the real meaning behind why you have a pit bull? I know this has taken a very strange turn, but it's just stuff that nobody, I feel like nobody really ever talks about it or says it, but it was just something that really was on my mind this weekend. And my dad, you see, my dad says it all the time. I don't know what you women are doing bringing pit bulls and curs and catahoulas into your house. Why in the world would a woman need a catahoula? What are you doing? <laughs> You know, and I, I, I don't know, you know, my parents have always loved my dogs. They've, they really have been very proud of me over vocally proud of me over that one area, but it is, it is bizarre. I feel safe with my dog. I've never, ever, ever felt ever one day afraid since I've had Enzo. Not one day have I been like, oh, there's something around the corner, you know, like I typically would have maybe felt, um, I haven't had that. I've had great companionship, um, but there's a lot of cons to it. There's a lot of things that I can't do and a lot of things I simply will not do because I have that kind of dog. I, I totally hear you because Zen is not a social dog. And when I was breeding dogs, I was breeding for sociability. So I was still breeding for working dogs and I put them in homes that were going to do things with them, but I was breeding for high will to please and sociability. Ooh, 
and because that makes them fun and yeah. they did fun things and they had interesting <laughs> lives they could go places they could do all the sports but they weren't um i'm gonna say premier protection quality mm -hmm. they were good some of them went to national events some of them did all right but there's a difference between like a dog like what i have now who's like police dog hard strong 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 hard and i didn't actually want this i wanted what i had i wanted high sociability high love of work capable of doing a lot of things mm. and um the downside is a lot of maintenance like and i do think people are now breeding dogs and i have expressed this i don't think i'm going to say anything that belgian people aren't aware that i feel i think a lot of people are starting to breed dogs that have to live in crates or kennels because they're impossible in the right. house the arousal levels are too high and they're so fixated on these huge, big biting dogs. It's like, okay, that's fine. One one hundredth of the dog's life is actually engaged in these activities. They're not police dogs. So they're not out with their officer right. all day long. Cause that's a good quality of yeah. life. They, they're always on the job. Exactly. I don't, I don't I have no problem with that, but they end up living in a way that the only thing they can do is this one sport. And then I wonder what happens when they get injured, right? Three years of age, they come off something badly their back gets tweaked. There's nothing left for some of these dogs because the only thing they're really good at is one thing. Like they can't just do other right. sports. Right. And that I'm actually in the same place. My next dog won't be a Belgian. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not just this. I've but heard you like talk about that before. Yeah. Like, yeah, like for I, I a just, while um, I've heard you say that. I feel like it's too hard to find people who are consistently breeding what I'm looking for, mm. the trade-offs I would make. Mm -hmm. And even little things like the e-collar are part of this. So they breed for dogs that are stronger and harder and biting more and more and more because then they can use the e-collar and get the dog off. Kind of. It doesn't always work that way, but you get the yeah. idea. Yeah. And so I have a dog that would be fine with an e-collar in training. He, he wouldn't care. He, he just wouldn't care. I mean, I know some, oh, abuse, abuse. Okay, well, whatever. He would be like, <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, he is just, he's a tough dog. He's yes. a hard, he's not going to care. He's going to be like, oh, so if I do this, that happens, then I won't do that. Okay. But I also feel like he does not have the kind of will to please my girls have. Like a, just a, a more natural cooperativeness about them. Yeah. Um, which is supposed to be Belgians are supposed to be highly cooperative dogs. Now, he's a good boy and he mm -hmm. wants to get it right, basically. <laughs> But, but but he's not gonna lose too much sleep over it if I'm yeah. not happy with him. It's not gonna mm. like are you ha are you mad now? Are you mad? Like, and I have to work really hard to get that cooperation, but it kind of worries me. Now the thing you said about safety. So um, I will go out to events at night in my RV. If I get tired or the fog comes into the rain, I do not think twice. I pull over wherever I am, and that dog sits in the front seat, and I'm like. Yeah, because you know an RV door, you, anybody just walk through that door. You know, right. you can't, not yeah. with that dog in the car. Yeah. So I have to say <laughs> oh, that, like, there's a sense of safety that, that I mm -hmm. do appreciate. I'm not a fearful person. I'm not the kind of person who won't go places. Yeah, same. But <clears throat> even so, there are some places it'd be dark. I come in at night and I'm looking around and I'm like, this is probably not the place I would have chosen mm -hmm. if I didn't have this particular dog mm -hmm. with me. So... Yeah. I love that. I don't love that I have to pay attention. I don't love that my friends can't come up and just interact with him quietly. I don't love that if I want to go out of town, it's this massive event, you know, like the amount of instructions I have to give to my husband who then doesn't even listen to me. So like there's huge <laughs> stress, you know, like, you know, like yeah. today, like I'm like, look, he doesn't leave the house, keep him in the house. He can go in the pool. If anybody comes over, put him in the crate. And I was like, oh, well, I took him to the ranch, but he's pretty good. I kept a toy. So he mostly stayed around unless the rabbits came. And I'm just like, exactly what I didn't want to happen. Because now if he gets this pattern of chasing rabbits. It's going right. to cause me some massive issues, right? But right. I love my husband. I'd like to keep him. So I, you know, I let most of these yeah. things go. Mm -hmm. But the next dog is going to be a border collie. And I don't. I do love the Belgian. I love the quickness of the brain. There's so many things I love, but I not love in aspects of where the breed is going. And I do think the e-collar is part of it. You know, they just, you yeah. breed to your training method to some extent. 
And I worry for dogs. Wow, and, a... you know, hunting dogs, I don't know about the pointers, but the retrievers, some of those dogs get a really bad road. And yeah. those e-collars are a big part of it. Like, yeah. I I'm not saying all dogs. I'm not saying it has to be that way. I'm just saying there's enough going on out there that, you know, like I'll watch them on Instagram teaching their force fetch. Man, I'm talking, these are some pretty unsophisticated trainers I'm watching. Yeah. And reading the comments, people don't even know they're watching incredibly unsophisticated training. It's just like, the timing is non-existent. The, the whole picture is so distressing to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. I, I also think the force free community, the ones that are just screaming abuse at every turn and it's yeah, not like I that. Yeah, I want to pivot into that. I want to pivot into that for a second because I, I but like, we went from, we were going along, kind of going along, singing a song, and then there was a lot of disruption in the industry we felt like that was that came to a fever pitch and then there was like some kumbaya -ing. you know there was yep. some some nice things going on and now there's you know a whole movement or what is attempting to be a movement to ban a well-respected trainer from another country oh yeah yeah just heard about that yeah, yeah. so i do think that um the topic of the e callers just become so divisive that I just I, I simply can't get involved in it in like content creation I I, I haven't really ever yeah because um, I've never I I tend to stay out of things that I don't yep. that I don't use yep. I don't have any experience with an e-caller I've never used one so it's kind of silly for me to talk about it you know and I know a lot of people that use them and they use them well so I really just don't feel like I have a lot to add to the conversation people know I don't use them if they want to come and watch my training they can come and watch my training and they'll see me not using them and or they can ask questions and then they can do that if that suits them or they can continue using them you know the people that I know and that I associate myself with uh, would not be harming dogs yeah. they, they might not even be the best best trainers but they're thoughtful and they're trying and they put effort into their education and for me that's enough um, when we, we start talking about groups of people within the dog training community trying to restrict the right of individuals to essentially make a living, when, when groups are mass committing, I, I think what is defamation, it just makes it so hard to, I mean, I have felt discouraged and I don't have anything to worry about with my training or my methods or whatever, but it's bleak it is bleak denise you know what are your what are your words of encouragement i mean well the first thing is <laughs> i have found myself this past year in a really weird position advocating for balanced trainers at every turn right i'm not a same. balanced trainer mm -hmm, I, same <laughs> i am such an advocate for force free training i love everything about force free training but I don't believe in abuse. I don't believe in abuse towards people. I don't believe in abuse towards dogs. I don't believe in creating. I'm just, I come down on the education side always. Always, it does not matter what the topic yeah. is because anytime yeah. you see force used to get your way of any type, I'm not talking about dogs, it doesn't hold up. You know, like when people don't understand the purpose behind laws, they don't pay attention to the laws. I, okay, so the, <laughs> the, the, the speed limit on the freeway is 65. How many are going 65? Only the ones who think a cop is running up their butt, you know, mm -hmm. why? Because they don't see the logic. They say, but mm -hmm. I can go 75 on this freeway. So they go 75. And that's the thing about laws. Like if people don't agree with the laws, if they don't think they're sensible, they just work their way right around them. Right. And I, I would love to see people using many, 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 many fewer e-callers. I would love to see Same. regulation. Mm -hmm. But I find myself like this stuff that's happening now with, well, let's ban this trainer and that train. And so here I am in this weird position saying, that's not a good idea. Like you said, it's somebody's living, but more important, I believe that there are, I'll name them. Uh, Michael Ellis is the number one that comes to my mind. Michael Ellis yes. trains very differently than me. He uses e-collars and I can say without question that Michael's teaching about how he uses the e-collar has improved the lives of dogs because 
the way people use them back when I was using them, you just turn that shit way up and start pushing the button. Like we had no intelligence, mm -hmm. no finesse. Mm -hmm. It was all punishment based. So now you got people like Michael teaching people to use them in a much kinder way. Would I prefer they didn't use them? Absolutely, 100%. But the thing is, that's not, it's not my decision to make. Other people are going to decide if they want to use punishers. We use punishers so heavily in our society that on ourselves, on our children, I don't even mean physical, just we just are a punishment society. And I really believe that when you want to change behavior, any bit, dog, human, you got to start where they're at and then you notch them around, right? So if a person's at an eight, you can take them to a nine or a seven. If a person's at a two, you can take them to a one or a three, but you can't take a two and make them an eight and you can't make an eight and make them a two. So people who are strong advocates of e-collar use, high level, not sophisticated, you take away their e-collar and you're going to see shit you don't want to see. Like they will find that's alternatives. What, that's what a commenter just said. They were like, wait till they take away e-collars and then the people start making up homemade exactly. shit. Exactly. So the crazy ass people, the cruel, sick, crazy people, they're going to stop being cruel, sick, crazy. What it will do is take them out mm -hmm. of the hands of people who are middle, who just are mindless. Yeah. Uneducated. It, exactly. Confused. But, the, but already had, you're going to have people out there, I swear to God, they'll be taking batteries and they'll be putting wires in them. They'll be doing mm -hmm. stuff like that. I wish we had never gotten to where we are with the e-collar. I'll say that. Well, but well, you know, in this society, we have had precedent after precedent of what happens when you use prohibition, banning, regulation. So number one, prohibition. Right and then what do we we got well now we got hooch now we got moonshine now we got an entire illegal and, economy and people blind running booze they're yeah. using this stuff that's not safe that's right, right. So, and now it's unsafe exactly. yeah we did that with the war on drugs we're just gonna we're just gonna put all of you an entire generation of you let's just put y'all in jail and see how that works yeah you know it's we're just gonna just say no just ban everything just it's um it's a form of purity culture. It's so my a form worry, of abstinence, like uh, how they say, just don't have sex. Yeah, and then, I don't think that's going to work. That's with not the working. Teenagers. That's not working. And <laughs> that don't have his babies. That's the way it goes. <laughs> that's right. But the problem with what's happening now, what's upsetting me so much, is not the one individual and all that. That's just a symptom. Right. Correct. The problem is the per the people who are doing this are creating such anger and understandable. Yeah and division that when people like me come along and say, hey, I can help you do this in a way that's a little bit kinder. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to hear from me. I have friends, force-free friends, who have found themselves in circumstances of balanced communities where they said they used to get along fine and now people shun them because they are them, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. uh, like people come over from Europe who used to use tools, they can't, and they're so angry that they won't even interact normally with force-free trainers anymore. Mm -hmm. Force-free trainers aren't giving them any grief. It's like now there's this broad brush across all force-free trainers. That makes my job hard. I yeah. cannot educate what I do, what I care about. I can't communicate that to you if you're angry with me, if you think I'm the enemy. The I am enemy. not the enemy. I'm right. not the enemy. I, I, you know, when I, I saw a little bit of a, oh, I don't know the word to use, but I saw a little bit of an issue coming up with a trainer being named that we had on our live. It's Ashley Lambert from Chaos Canine. Yeah, she was being singled out by the force, some of those in the force free community as because she does what we do. She speaks out for balanced trainers saying, hold up. We're not going to be hateful over here and say that we're force free here and then be hate. And, and I thought, wow, when I, I mean, when, when you start coming for the mediators, for the reasonables <laughs> in the middle, you know, that's when you get a lot of that, the yucky feelings I think that we're having is because those that are willing to speak honestly and be vulnerable and see different sides of this. Um, it's like politics. It's like what happens in politics. The reasonables get pushed out and the extremes go head to head and everybody watches. And and we think, you don't represent me. You don't represent me. Why are you guys even talking about that? And then, you know, somebody like Ashley, I would think about a hundred times before getting in a fight with her. And here's why. <laughs> she is a clear, clean, concise communicator. Yes. Like, 
I, very quick I, in the brain you, too. you know mm -hmm. and she's gonna come back in that way she has that kind of even tempered way and she's going to lay you out flat so yeah i would think twice mm -hmm. before being stupid like hysterical stupid because she's gonna lay you out yeah i would never but the thing ever. is i would people never. like her she's so valuable to us she's mm -hmm. she's our people right I know. she's She's a good trainer. She is listening. She's giving a lot of high quality content. So and she's great behind the scenes. She's the same person behind the scenes. And she's also in the service dog community. My God, you know, like like actively helping regular people that can't afford thirty six thousand dollars service dogs. You know, that's such a huge asset to I, the community. I and just, to see I her honestly, singled out. I honestly do not understand what's happening these days. Why are you I love that word mediator. Why are you mm -hmm. taking out your own people? You're taking out your own well, we, educators. We see this in dictatorships. We see this in dictatorships where, you know, the, the, their own people begin to just be another means to the end or a commodity to them to use in gaining towards their goal. Um, and I'm not really sure what the actual goal is. I don't really know what the goal is to just say until pain is stopped in training. That's not a goal. That's not a clear, concise mission. I think to say that we'd like to show people how to use, you know, more compassionate methods, that's a pretty clear mission. Most people can go, oh, okay, so you just want to show me how to do what I'm doing, but nicer? Okay. You know, that, that sounds pretty simple, pretty clear. But to say that a mission is to eradicate something that's so subjective, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, maybe I'm just it's, like dis, disheartened, disillusioned. I, I'm not sure the right word, but I feel like a, just a sadness about it. And I'm really not sure what to do. So I've just decided to just talk about my clients more. I think because, none of us knows what to do because- yeah. It's like, I would give anything to have him as the other side, honest to God. I want a balance trainer to act as crazy as he does because that makes all the normal logical people look over there and go, I don't think I want to be like that. I want to be a force yeah. person because he's so crazy. Yeah. When I look at the behavior I see in elements of our, my own community, I'm afraid they're going to drive the best young most thoughtful people to the other side of the fence because out of resistance like i said i'm at the point where i look like a balanced trainer the conversations i'm having right because i'm so like horrified mm -hmm. by some of what i'm seeing around me i'm like look 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 i'm not that person i'm not that person yeah. i know what my mission is I, i've never I, I have not doubted where i was going in a long time and people like that make my job hard they just make my job hard. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I want to go into this, this next topic because it, it's just what we're talking about. It, the other thing that makes the job hard is how oversaturated this market is now. I feel like we're like basically hairstylists and you could have one, <laughs> one hairstylist that's neck that like has a chain of successful, amazing salons is doing all the hair is crushing it and you can't tell them apart from the one that works at supercuts because everybody just thinks that they're all hairstylists and it doesn't matter that's how i feel and i'm like wow if the if it's oversaturated that's not a great place for us to be because that means that people's eyes are going to get tired of it and we've gone to do so much work to make this accessible that it's now become so accessible that people can get it without paying any of us you know there's this constant balance of <laughs> of trying to manage i think being a professional dog trainer and and being ethical and you know um, i mean i don't have to balance being ethical i'm not saying that we have to do that but you know i think that there's people out there that are really struggling right yeah. now so I spent my weekend at my dog sports camp. Once a year we have a camp. And this is the time that's really interesting because so many people after the event are really excited about what we do there. And one thing I'm kind of seeing as a common thread is I have never been in an environment which was so welcoming, 
I have never had such an experience of leaving the drama behind. Several people commented, it was amazing to have no, not only no drama, no mention of drama. No, nobody talks about training methods at these things. We talk about good training. We just get out there and we yeah, learn yeah. And, we, and we educate and, and we interact in a very open, free way. Like nobody sits alone. That's the thing, right? Somebody, you get, if you see a person who looks lonely, you take responsibility for bringing them in, right? That's, that's yeah. what the community does. Yeah. And so I'm reading that. all these comments from people who are like, this was one of the best weekends of my life. Yeah, just to see that's what community is. And then to come yeah. back to the real world. And I mostly try to ignore the real world, but <laughs> to realize it's, you know, it's like being in a balloon and there's yelling around the outside. You're inside, but you mm -hmm. know, out there, it's just, it's very sad to me. It's sad for those people that they don't know what it's like to be in a yeah. community which is welcoming is genuinely open to each other not because mm -hmm. we're all the same but because we have enough in common that we start there yeah that's why you and you know apparently here we go again right now you know i blocked voldemort and um <laughs> i did and i gotta tell yeah, you, I you gotta, sometimes you just gotta send them to the block party denise i, I should have done that six months ago it's like i don't know what, well you know what i think i think that as as much as we are self-aware and realists and practical, I think there may have been in all of us that have engaged in that controversy, just a little tiny bit of, but maybe I can affect some change here. Maybe I can say something that will have some effect. Yeah, I think it's just nat human nature, but I also think it's in the nature of leaders to to step up and try to say something and, and do something that may be effective. And sometimes certain people, you just can't, you just cannot engage with certain people. I've met a couple of them over the years in the dog training industry. I can pull them up into my mind right now. And I know, you know, the two I'm thinking of, but it's just, it's just pointless. And what I hate about that is that when something is pointless, and in this kind of cancer continues to grow that's where the helplessness comes in yeah and that's where we start feeling like so i just have to put up with this so i just have to watch this and listen to this and well no we don't have to we just know that it's there and we hope that by continuing on in our our missions which are very positive we can affect change in that way because i just don't see um any point I just don't see any point I, and, and it's going to make me lose my mind. I mean, you've heard me talk about my, you know, people listening to misunderstand. Yes. You know, and it doesn't take, like you, if you look for it that way, it does not take long when you realize someone's screaming, often untruthful, just lies. And when you say to them factually, what you just said is incorrect. This is not mm -hmm. how it happened. Let mm -hmm. me tell you the truth. When they start screaming in a new direction, that's all the information you need right there. Right. Like they're not looking for understanding. Mm -hmm. They're looking for emotion right. and to feel and to exist. And I get faster and faster walk because you can't, you can't work with those people unless you're the same as them. And I don't have the bandwidth to hang out with people like that. Cause also that would be weird. It, it's just angry people. They suck you dry. Like in, in a, in a, in a for conversations. Way. Absolutely. It's exhausting. Absolutely are exhausting they're insufferable and yeah. we should not suffer them and you, know, you have yeah, to watch I, mean behavior and i don't like to be mm -hmm. around mean behavior that is my bubble yeah. i tend to just when i see people behaving badly i'm like you know i can't do anything about yeah. that uh, i do think we should have a lot more blocking going on than is going on because yeah. if you take away the fodder yeah I, there's no i think you're ready right. to for them to attack if you've just moved on you block 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 i mean if you think about it then who do they talk about? There's I, not much left. I didn't even choose blocking. I just unfollowed and stopped engaging and watching. And that was enough for me. That was enough to stop whatever was going on. Um, I get way more upset 
when people pick on my friends than when oh, they pick on me. I agree. When they pick on me, I'm like, whatever, idiot. You know, like you, you have no idea what I say to myself in my head sometimes. That's nothing. You know, like <laughs> there's no, it's really hard to make me genuinely upset about something that some random person that doesn't really know me has said about me. Now, if somebody I know says like something to me, sometimes it might hurt my feelings, but you know, you practice at that stuff. But if somebody comes after my people, I tell you what, I'm bringing Molotov cocktails. We're getting, I mean, samurai swords out from my back. I just can't help it. I've always been like that. So, you know, I, I recognize, I learned a lot from the situation. I learned a lot about what I don't want to do, uh, who my core group of people is, which is really important because we're lucky to have a core group of people if we have one. There's people that have no one, not a single person, you know? So I, I thought about that and I think about, about how I want to show up on social media. You know, I went, I just, being antagonistic and using my platform to discuss all of the things that I do not like, I just can't do. I can't. I, I had to slow way down on talking about diversity and inclusion and all those things because I realized what I was doing was platforming all the things that I wanted to be different but felt maybe powerless over. And so I would just yell about them, you know, instead of talking about all the ways that I am contributing to diversity, the, all the ways that I am contributing to inclusion and the changes that I've made, I think by influence to the dog training industry, those are profoundly more important than me not liking someone doing A, B or C and then starting a video series about it. You know, that really isn't adding. That's, that's not adding to the collective intelligence, that's adding to the collective trash that people have to sift through. And I've done that enough and I just don't want to do it anymore. So what I've noticed, Jerry, um, well, this sounds so obnoxious, but it's just true. Your account on social media and my account are two of the kindest, like when you read the common threads, have no. you noticed? It's so that sweet. We have the good I, people. Like no. we have the kind, supportive people who just lift each other up and cheer for each other. And there's almost no nastiness. Like there's just yeah. you find other accounts like that. Like I the other accounts I see out there, they're just there are a few. I can think of a couple of others, but for the most part, it's like so much ugliness, nastiness. It's everything I don't want. And I'm really proud of my social media. And I see your social media is like evolved to this because it wasn't like this before. Right. It's evolved to the same place. It's like, you're not going to have fun here. If your idea of a good time is being an asshole, like it's just not going to be fun. It's for not going to be fun. You're not going to get, gonna be terrible. you're not going to get support for being mean, right? Like yeah. here you're going to get support for lifting people up mm -hmm. and that's, you know, over time, I think that is what brings in the right people. And you should talk about anything you want to talk about. Yeah. But when you, when you're in an audience of people who respect you and are interested, then they want to learn the things you have to say. You don't have to yell. You can just talk. And you can make mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. And I just say when I make them and I change my behavior and people are so forgiving and, and they appreciate the openness and, um, you know, I don't think that's modeled a lot, uh, openly saying, oh, I was wrong. This is how I made the amends. This is what I'm going to do moving forward. You know, I certainly know that it wasn't modeled to me until I got into a 12-step program and had, you know, people to help me. So, yeah, I mean, I noticed, like, just in this live, one person said something and then three people were like, hey, it's okay, but you need to make these changes because you can't just keep, that's the other thing I like about our follow, our, our followings, excuse me, is that there's a lot of honesty. You know, if somebody says something and they're not taking accountability, somebody's gonna find a loving way to say, well, you know, <laughs> and they're not gonna be mean, but they're just gonna be like, hey, that happened to me and it was me. And this is the action step that I took. It's, it's very um, simple, it's very inclusive, 
it's an, they're incredibly engaging communities, always engaging, always showing up and people are coming back. Yeah. So it's not just constantly new people that are showing up to see what they can grab and run away with. It's people that are really interested in continuing to listen to our thoughts as they evolve and as we figure things out. And I just love it. That's why I'm here. Yeah. That's why I'm an educator because you get, and I know you get these too. You get those nice little notes from people saying, I just want to tell you, I've been listening for however long and you've changed, not just my dog training. You've changed me. Yeah. Like the way I carry myself in life, when I run into a challenging situation, the way I handle this. And that's just like, Oh, that just kept me going for the best thing. Right? Like it's just, that puts up with a lot of Voldemort's because yeah. that's an individual. When an individual says, not just the dog training, mm -hmm. you changed who I think. Yeah. I'm like, that's, that's pretty big. That's a lot of power. So if a person's looking for power, the power to help other people get to a better place in their life, I don't know what, what else do you want? I mean, that's like the gift yeah, that you give right? It's the ultimate high, I can tell you that. I mean, I, I shouldn't have said so before, the happiest that I've ever been in that moment. So the, there is another, it's when someone quits, like just by virtue of just knowing me and being around me and, and however they figure figured it out. There's a lot of people in my life. And if you can figure out how to get close to me and stay close, there's, there's something there, you know, we're, we're friends. We're really, there's something there. And when that happens and that person ends up getting sober or ends up in what is recovery to them for them, whatever that is, if it's, maybe it's food, maybe it's booze, maybe it's sex, maybe it's whatever, it doesn't matter. And, and they stay friends with me and I get to see them grow as a human, it's like having a baby. I don't know how to explain what it feels like. There's an, it's like that feeling the second that you see your baby and you're like, that's a fucking miracle. Oh, I said two plus words. That's a miracle, you know, where you're like, I can't even believe that this has happened. And it happens a lot to me. I, I mean, in the time that I, went into recovery, I could think of dozens of faces of people that have said, like, you literally saved my life by just existing and being you and telling your story. You, that was enough for me to hang on to something for until I could get that for myself. And it's like, when That's Carly, made, Carly, she's in, I don't know if she's still here, but she's in the chat. When Carly made that video this morning uh she made a video about how a year ago she was in that rv i saw it i just like i don't know what it was about that but it just it, it was like um i understood a lot about life in that moment because I, I there were times where i thought she was being crazy i thought how, how long is this gonna go on this isn't this is to the point of where i'm worried about your safety this is, you know, all, all the things like she has a great husband. So hats off to Mike, but you know, it's just, but, but she, she stuck it out regardless of what anyone said and in the middle of all of that, whatever chaos that was, she quit drinking and is still sober. I, you know, you, you could take all the other stuff away. You know, uh, there's, there's somebody else in the chat that I won't name right now. But they, same thing. And I didn't know that they were in recovery. I didn't know. And they were like, what I found you and did your apprenticeship program and was able to kind of develop this relationship with you, you do not know how bad I needed that in my life. I was barely making it. And then all of a sudden you came in and you know, I come with friends. That's the cool thing about me. I come with a posse <laughs> and, they, and they know, like we're here to be friends with everybody and to bring everybody in and make sure that everybody feels like they're not alone because it literally saves lives. That's what's gonna change people. It's not yelling that we need to remove pain and fear. That's obvious. And I'm tired of us talking about the obvious things and ignoring the other obvious things, which are the loneliness epidemic, you know, 
which is driving people to behave in ways that I don't think they want to. Um, I don't know. Lots of things to think about. Man, I we think, I'm glad you know, we didn't have a guest on. This is way, this is all over the place. <laughs> like our, I mean, in a good way. But the but cool thing it, this, is our guests would have just pivoted with us. They, they would have. That's true, because true, we have great guests. I think, We've had consistently wonderful guests. We do. I think what you do, you normalize life. Like, mm. you know, social media is a, it's a commercial, right? So it's always like, looking amazing and and you and i are both like well just so you know <laughs> that was the highlight like there's this other aspect and i do it more around dog training and you do it more around life but either yeah. way there's kind of a sense of this is the real picture let me this is what i'm showing you but make sure you understand some context i think that's very um reassuring and validating to your average schmo who's out there going my life doesn't look like that like yeah. i'm and that is lonely. That drives loneliness. Ugh. Even if you've got people all around you, if you feel like they're living this amazing TV life and you're just like, God damn, I can't even pay the rent. I can't get enough clients. Right. My dogs. I'm not having these miracles that everybody else is having. I think you normalize like the process. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's really nice for people to be around that. Cause it's like, God, this makes me feel better. Like yeah. I was talking at camp and, and I saw it again. And when I was doing my introduction speech, I was saying, you know, guys, if you've got a miracle dog, that's awesome. And, you know, fine. Everybody will be like, oh, that's cool. I said, but you know what? If you have a dog who's suffering and struggling, you are the one everyone is cheering for. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's not the way you think it is. It's not the super right. cool dogs. It's this, it's, and I saw it again. There was a dog that was having a really hard time. And when it got it, the whole audience was like, yeah, because it's like, we, we, feel cry. For the, we feel for the underdog. You know, we really do. The owner of the underdog yeah. is all stressed out. Like, oh, my dog this, my dog that. But it's like, no, actually, everybody's on your team, especially when you support your dog. When you say something like, my dog's having a really hard time. Can we just sit here? Like, can we just not do the exercise? Mm -hmm. And the kinds of people I was around are across the board going to say, absolutely. Like, yeah. matter of fact, we're going to take your dog out of the ring. And we're going to go over here together mm -hmm. and we're going to do what we need to do to make things work for you. And yeah, so cool to watch how most people inside of them totally rise to the occasion, totally rise to the occasion. They're just like, that was so awesome. And I saw people approaching other people saying, I just want to tell you how much I admired you when you realized your dog was having a bad time. And rather than trying to push through, you opted to leave the situation. Yeah. It's like, so cool to see that. I think people really misunderstand what actually impresses other people. Mm. And I think that kind of, that's what it means to be genuine, right? Right. And I think that impresses, inspires, and pulls people to want to be around you. Because it's like, yeah. this is, she's not going to judge me. She's going to support me when things are rough. Well, in, in recovery, that whole thing that you just said is one of the foundational pillars that the newcomer is the most important person in the room every single time, every single meeting. And you will often hear if somebody says, yeah, I'm new, you know, when you go around and ask if there's any visitors or any new people, you'll hear several people in the room when it's their turn to share, turn and look at them and address them, which is, we don't do crosstalk, we don't do that, but when there's a newcomer, it's okay to turn and look at them and be like, you know, you're the most important person here. And this whole entire meeting is for you. What is there something you want to talk about? Is there something you want? And we make it all about them. And then when the meeting's over, everybody huddles around them. And, and I hope you come back. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter if they just came in from a bush or from under a bridge or wherever. They are truly the most important person in the room because they make us all remember what it was like to be back there and the desperation and the frustration and the hopelessness and how we were basically delivered from that. And so I think that that sentiment certainly needs to be carried into dog training, like what you guys were doing is where no, actually the ones that are the most 
important here that we need to pay the most, not maybe the most important because everybody's important, but the ones that we need to pay the most attention to here are the ones that are really struggling, that need the help, like not the, not the perfect ones that are looking the best and doing the things. And the, that's why I am the way that I am and why, I, well, that's why I present myself the way that I do, because I want people to know that you don't have to, you can, you can say cuss words, you can not have makeup on, you can be wearing uh, sweatpants, you can be just a regular person and do exactly what I'm doing. I think that that's important because when I watch, well, I don't really know that they're out there a lot anymore, but when this became popular on social media in 2020, there was something like, like weird going on with, with women, which I was one of them, with women using their looks to kind of get popular as dog trainers. I mean, it's not just in dog training, it happens everywhere. But, and I quickly realized what that did to my following. My following was all, all men. And it made it impossible for me to grow and share that with my following because they were not interested in that. They that, weren't interested in that. They wanted to look at me. So, and it took me a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, a year and a half. Yeah. To flip my following to where it was mostly women. And I did that by stopping wearing makeup. I stopped wearing makeup for a year. I did not wear makeup for an entire year, hardly ever. And I just showed up every day as I was and I trained my goat and I talked about the mechanics of the boring mechanics of dog training. And slowly it started to churn into a following that was curated for people that were actually there to learn from me and not look at me or make fun of me. You know, one, you know, of, one of the challenges I see is that numbers on social media, how many followers you have, it's like a fun metric, right? To play with, but yeah. it really, it's, it's truly just a fun number. Yeah. Like my following grew a lot in the last six months. And yet the number of people who watch my videos hasn't changed that much. Correct. The Same. number of people yeah. who interact and comment has, it's, mm -hmm. And I just am fascinated by how can I go from 20 to 80 and have nothing change? And you know, the reason is my core, I, I just happen to have a few popular videos, right? And they got me a lot of attention, but those aren't my people. Yeah. They're people who saw a cool video. And mm -hmm. I have a clue about, about what that means to have cool videos. But I also kind of am like, yeah, but why do I care? It's a bigger number, but mm -hmm. what really matters is what do the people who actually care about me, what do they want? What do they need? Yeah. So they want some pet content dog skills. for them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and what do I care about? I love my dog sports. So you may not like it. You might like, duh, you're going to get it because I love it. So <laughs> it's my thing. But at the same time, I'm like, but what do people need that I think I can give them? So something simple like teaching my dog to put his head on the couch, oh, yeah. covering his head. Yeah, and, I was yeah. watching that today. So that's like, that's just my life. That's a piece of my life. Here's a piece of my life that yeah. might interest you. But if you're making content if i have to look a certain way if i have to do all of that i'm not even sure it would help like i might get me bigger numbers but why does that help me if that if that doesn't change the culture on dog training if that if that's right i'm not i'm right. not i don't have sponsors so it's not like i need big numbers for sponsors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i wonder how many people think about that because it's fun to get videos with lots of likes and comments but at the end of the day if it doesn't influence behavior if it doesn't change how people think not necessarily training just anything then i don't know that it's all that useful to me i had a conversation with the guy that we both know about his following and i probably incorrectly pro probably incorrectly made a comment before i should have said something to him first but we're really good friends and so i think it was okay but um it was that I, I commented, I said, you know, the, your following man is among the most, most atrocious <laughs> comments I've ever seen. I mean, I don't know what was wrong with me that day. I just yeah. had it with the, with the, with the, his followers. And it, it, you know, this, this is, this is not the person we were talking about before everyone. This is someone that is a genuine friend of mine and that Denise knows as well. And, and we had a private conversation about it. And that led into, you know, the followings and kind of what we're talking about. And the bottom line is like, you can be 
really good at getting attention. You can be really good at viral reels, which I am, but it doesn't mean that it, it's just to your point. It doesn't mean that that large group of people that I grew off of a reel. So maybe let's say I got two or 3000 followers. It doesn't mean that 3000 of those people are now genuinely interacting a lot with my content. What that means right. is that those 3000 people will be shown my stuff probably one more time yep. since they just followed me all pop up in their feed. If they choose to engage with it, um, they will and all they'll continue to see me um, or if they watch it. But if not, I will fade into the ether, you know, and be maybe brought back up a couple more times if they start looking at dog stuff or horse stuff or something like that. So that, that it, it's a, it's a funnel. It's a funnel out of those 3000 people. I might get a hundred that are like, hmm, I like dogs. Cool. This lady's kind of cool. What's she got going on? And they'll, they'll maybe watch. And out of those hundred people, I might get 10 that, that stick around and engage and stay a part of my community and talk to me on my stories, which is where my community engages with me for the most part. You know, it's, it doesn't mean what people think that it means. You know, no. it never, it never has. But if you are good to your following and you talk to your following and you answer your comments and you answer your DMs, you, you can have a meaningful community online. I think um, so. Oh, for sure. And if you're genuine sure. and if you are behind the scenes, who you are publicly, people appreciate that. I just had a, someone to reach out, reach out to me that saw my reel on what to do when you see something actual abuse being committed. Yeah. And it was a very, very long message. And it was like, basically like asking me if that's always excusable. And we got into a very long conversation about this person's trauma, which was absolutely horrifying, their own human trauma. And they were trying to understand if what I meant was that this was excusable. And we got into this really long, beautiful conversation. And at the end of it, they were like, thank you for letting me say all that and talk about this here. I don't really have anyone that I can. And it was a man. It was a man. And I thought, oh, oh my God. So you're just walking around, not talking to anybody about this. And then you just ask a question to a person on Instagram and they answer back and you talk to them. And then it's fun. like, that is how easy it is to help someone. That is how easy it is to just kind of be that person that they, and, and I, I can't see having a large platform and not using it for that. Mostly. Depends why you're I mean, here. we can use it for a lot of things. I mean, it depends why you're here. Like, yeah, you see it. I see it. I've run around Instagram. It's kind of interesting game to play to ask yourself, why do you think this person is here? And then to ask mm. yourself, would they answer the same way? Because there's a lot of people I look at, I can usually kind of figure out if I watch several videos, why do I think you're here? And I think a lot of people wouldn't like the conclusion I've come to. Like, I think they might recognize it's true, but they might feel a little uncomfortable about that. Yeah. Um, there's an awful lot of in-group signaling. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to change anybody's mind. You're just talking to people who already think exactly like yeah. you. And the mm -hmm. only reason to waste your time putting up content for people who think exactly like you is so that you can cement the relationship within your own community. And right. that's fine. But then I wonder why that's so, how much of that do you need to do? Like, I don't know. I think it's good enough to just say, this is kind of where I stand in this community and that community. I don't feel like I need to, I hope I don't have to keep refreshing it. Like to, to convince people that I'm 100% lockstep with you. Cause I'm probably not, <laughs> but it's not important to me. I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe some people have more need for, um, homogeneity. Yeah. Honest. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a lot of need to be homogenous. Like I, oh. I don't, I don't need to be around people who are like me. Yeah. Actually it's more interesting mm -hmm. to be around people who are like me in some ways and different in other ways. Cause that's just, I don't know, kind of interesting way to go through that's life. My my favorite. I like it yeah. when we're way different, but we like the same things. Cause I'm like, Ooh, you have good taste and you're totally different than me. And you're going to bring all these things out in my character and help me refine myself, you know, in these ways, but we can hang out cause we like the same stuff. Oh my gosh. Now we're, we have this, the stage is set, you know, we're going to be together. We're talking about stuff that we like, 
and just by nature of like the way the iron sharpens iron, we're both going to become better people just by being around each other because we're so different. You're going to, you know, that's, <laughs> that sounds so stuff. fun. <laughs> like I learned today, I learned all about, I don't know anything about pointers and pointing trials, like more than the average person, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm really interested in hearing about your weekend because it was like, now I know. I yeah, know some something stuff. different, something totally different. I've also noticed when I, when people that are different, different than me when I really ask them about things that they're doing and what it just goes so much deeper than I thought and they impress me much more than I thought I'm like oh I just thought that you liked you know like Madison she like she was like yeah I like Dungeons and Dragons I was like what and then she tells me she's at like some master level in Dungeons and Dragons and I was like dude that's cool I mean I don't play Dungeons and Dragons but that makes me like you more that you like love something so much that you spend all of this time yeah. like in tournaments and, and playing it and doing things like I love that for you. I love that you have something that you love, this, you know, even if it's not my thing. Talk about their passion. My dad, for him, it was um, certain kind of plants. One was cactus. Really? And other, yeah. And the other streptocarpus. Anyway, <laughs> so. I don't actually care about either of those things, but I actually liked listening to my dad because he was so excited about it and passionate about it. And it's easy for me to ask questions and get him to run off in a new direction because I know nothing, yeah. right? But yeah. it's not the topic that interests me. It's his excitement around the topic. Yeah. And it's always fun to talk to a person who's super passionate about their thing and then because they want to share that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I wish we could let people do that in dog training and not poo poo We're on it. <laughs> and not so poo -poo on it. Somebody says, yeah, I do pointer traps. Oh, I don't like dog sports. The dog should just get to be a dog. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. Like we okay. don't have to say everything. Even if I, that is that. a dog being a dog. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know when, if you go to the pointer trials, you you're watching an English pointer run around in a field and they look so happy, you know? So that's, that's what I, that's what I took away from it is that when they're working and they're doing what they're bred to do, they're in lockstep. Like last night I took Layla's horse out because he's like, he was recovering from this injury. And I noticed that he had like a little bit of edema on his legs. And so I wanted to get him out, move him around, work him around. Okay. Well, that's a thoroughbred. He's off the track, so he used to be a racehorse. Then Layla turned him into a show jumper, then an eventing horse, then dressage, then barrels and poles, and you can do everything with him. Well, when I ask my horse to do something, he's like an old paint horse. He doesn't, he's like, mm, okay. Oh, well, okay. You know, he'll do it for me now because I ride him every day. I work with him almost every day. I got on her horse last night and I asked him, but for a small trot. And he was like, it was like I turned the key on a big block engine. Yeah. And he's like, boom, 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 boom. and then when you open it up and you get him out on the highway, he, he, you can feel it. You can feel that he's like, okay, let's go. And he wants to run and he doesn't just want to run. He wants to run top speed for a mile and a quarter. <laughs> you know? Wonder where that came Reckless from. Reckless abandon. You know, That's just no concern or self-preservation. He's going. Yeah. And and you can feel that. That's why I love thoroughbreds so much because the heart that they have and the work that, you know, when you tell them to do their job, they're doing it. And I love that. I would, I would hate to deny him that and make him like, like a lesson horse or – or just, well, you know, he runs and then it gets all, you know, or I just want to let him be a horse and eat grass. Like, I think that we have to ask what that means. If we're going to let a dog be a dog, I know only a handful of breeds in the non-sporting category that don't actually have a job. I mean, get a Bichon, I guess. A little Bichon Frise. Or some breeds get that have just been bred down so much. They're pretty happy to, That's which true. isn't a bad thing. They're I think content. that my dog is. I think that Enzo um, is a really great example. I would like to see more American bullies like him. Um, he does not have a super high obsessive drive, 
He does not have over, or like he doesn't struggle with over arousal. I know we've done a lot of training, but I've had this dog since he's a puppy. I remember, you know, and I was not a great trainer back then and I managed and, and I did okay. Um, he's affable and friendly. He's confident. He's fairly resilient, but he's also pretty sensitive. Yeah. And he's not, I never worry he's going to kill someone. Right. That, I've, I've that's never, a lot. Ever, I've never, ever, even with everything that I know, I've never looked at him and been like, you're going to kill that. Right. Now, now, if he was in a room alone with a rabbit, well, yeah, well, he's going to do yeah. what a dog does. Right, but I right, right, right. And, and I've never been like, I just tell children, don't touch my dog. If you're, if they're under a certain age, they're just not allowed. Um, and if they'd like to touch him, they can come and get me and I can set up a way that they can pet him where it's okay. And if I catch them touching him, you know, they're kicked out of the house. So I've, I've managed a lot of that, but I see a lot of pit bulls and a lot of bullies as personal clients. I'm definitely heavy in that area. I have more than more of that breed than, than the other breeds. Um, and man, some of these dogs. I mean, I figured out a really great routine for people that have high arousal, high drive bullies <laughs> that have, don't have a lot of time, but it's a lot of flirt pull, yeah. a lot of constant decompression after everything because they get so stimulated. Bike riding, we got to do this, we got to do that. It's just more than the average person yep. really is probably going to want to do. Yep. And the consequences for not doing it can be fatal. That's a tough road. It is. Yeah. It is. But, you know, we've we've talked about some ways to that people can avoid that by simply just looking at the dogs that they're getting and choosing for some of the stuff you were talking about earlier and not choosing for looks and coat color. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, we could solve 90% of the problems in the dog world if different if people made different choices in the first place. Yeah. You know, it's just don't, don't choose the dog because you feel sorry for it. Get the right dog for yeah. your circumstance. Get what you what makes sense for you based on where you are right now in life. Yeah. And that's. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I yeah. am. Give me a minute. You have to get off soon. Is that our cue? One, what's uh, it's yeah. Yeah. He had a job interview. So, oh. you know, Can I go my son a job interview. God. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to sit around and talk about our kids and whine. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, you got anything else tonight, Denise? No, it's always good to see you. Next week we gotta have a guest, so we have to sit down and come up with a name. We both just had a lot going on this past yeah. week, so it's just a little more than we could do. Well, we talked about all the things tonight, and I enjoyed myself. I think everybody else did. Too. Always enjoy myself here. All right. Good you guys. to see you, Jerry. It's good, good to, to have the rest of you guys you. along for the ride. Take care. Bye, bye bye. I'm going to put this on YouTube for those that want to watch there. Perfect.